really glad to have you on board. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's yeah. great to get a chance to chat with someone else who's so involved in the economic space around crypto. Yes, I see that you have started this thing called NFT flipping. Yeah, with that, I'm really going for trying to educate people around the kind of like reselling side of NFTs because there, yeah, there's the collectors and there's the resellers and they're both really big groups um, and both have their place to play in this ecosystem. So really wanted to create a place where I can uh, put out resources to support that group. Wonderful. So today we'll talk about the economics of NFT flipping, reselling and all the things around NFT. <laughs> so Sounds good. I guess, yeah, let's get started with some, some simple questions. So what is NFT? Uh, so NFTs are verifiable ownership of a digital asset. So the example I like to give is thinking about an item in a video game, because that's something that most people have had some sort of interaction with. So say you have like a rare sword from a video game. There's only 10 of them in existence. And there's a lot of demand for them. A bunch of players want them. They're super crazy special. But in a traditional video game, you don't really own it. If you tried to sell it, most of the time the game developer or studio, they would ban your account in response and you wouldn't have anything. So NFT really changes this and gives you total control over your digital assets because we're living in a really increasingly digital world. So having true ownership within that world is a really important aspect. And I think it's just going to continue to grow in importance as time goes on. So what I'm what I'm trying to figure out is how why is it so important to own a digital asset? Because you can do something as easy as screenshot it or copy and paste it. So why is it that digital assets verifiable ownership is so important? Yeah, so I guess to kind of compare it to other rare things, like if you have a trading card, for example, um, like one of those baseball cards that are in super high demand. Like if I wanted to, I could like print out a picture of that card, like put it on some cardboard and looking and make it all look nice, but I'm not going to be able to sell that for a million dollars. It's not the same as this other card. And so as we're going into the uh, arena of digital assets, um, just duplicating content, um, it's possible, but with NFTs, we're able to kind of make the distinction between what is the real asset and we've, and you can see like who's owned it in the past. So you could find out that some really famous person has been the previous owner of the NFT and that itself can give uh, value to this digital asset. Mm. So the thing is, no matter what, people can just copy and paste digital assets and replicate them. But with NFT or with blockchain, we can determine the authenticity and and like provenance of where this NFT is, which is one of the big value add of the digital assets on blockchain. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So when it comes to NFT, one of the big thing is investing in NFT. So how do you determine if NFT is investable or not? Yeah, and so that's something that can vary a lot by the asset and by um, the specific project you're talking about. But from looking at it from a broad sense, there's kind of the demand side and the supply side of it. So on the demand side, you're really thinking about what is gonna drive growth, what is gonna drive interest. Um, so a big thing there is community. Is there a big community around this game or around this artist or for whatever you're talking about, is there a community there that's active and engaged? Um, so that's definitely something you wanna look for and something you wanna be involved with too. Um, then you want to see if there's some kind of utility. Now, th this isn't necessarily a requirement, but it is a major plus. And this is something that's kind of hasn't been explored too much so far, but it's where I think that a lot of the growth is going to come in the NFT space, especially on like the gaming side of it. Once you have these items that people want to use within some really amazing games, then there's going to be a lot of NFT demand and driven solely on the utility side there. And then also just kind of measures of hype, like are people like 
chasing after it or they all over social media talking about that certain thing. Um, so it just kind of, those are kind of the measures that you would want to look for on the demand side in the broad sense. But you also don't want to forget about the supply side of an asset. You want to look at how scarce it is, like if it has super limited edition, but that's not necessarily the whole story there. You also have to look at um, the inflationary aspects of it. So I think that that's something that I'll, I'll touch on a little bit more later, but you just got to look at the how much the project is has been putting out more and more NFTs. Because if they, they're pumping out a whole bunch of them, then that might kind of start to diminish the value of the specific NFT that you're looking at. Okay, so to summarize, if NFT is investable or not, we have to look at the supply and demand. And the demand really comes from the community it has, the reach, the hype, the social psychology of people's interest in this specific NFT. And the demand side, on the supply side, we'll be looking at the release schedule, looking at the inflation that we'll talk about later, and looking at the, yeah, how, how rare these NFT will be. So one thing that I, I realized that NFTs releases are quite different from how like regular other tokens are being released. So regular tokens are released by, you know, there's a release schedule with Bitcoin. There is a fixed schedule with other kind of coins. You have different kind of mining, liquidity mining or other kind of mining schedule to, to reduce, to affect the, the supply side inflation. Whereas with NFT, it's slightly different as in, it's like special release dropping it, that's it. And so how, what is the differences between that and how are most of the NFTs released? Yeah, so there are a variety of types of NFT releases. Um, and I would categorize it into three main types. So you have auctions, you have uh, open editions, and you have draws. So you'll get these three different types. You can see them for all different types of NFTs, but I'll talk more specifically about kind of the art drops. So these, these are the uh, terms used specifically for Nifty Gateway. Um, so looking first at auctions, there are a few different types of these. You have your classic ascending bid auctions. You have silent auctions where you don't know other people's bids until after it's over in the top, however many uh, bids are then that then allocated the NFTs according to the people with the greatest uh, willingness to buy, willingness to pay. And then the last type of auction are Dutch auctions, which start off high and gradually low over time until someone decides to buy it. And so for auctions, you have the price as the mechanism that will fluctuate to um, to decide who gets the NFT. So the NFT will go to the person with the greatest willingness to pay. And with an auction, you're going to generally get to an equilibrium with the price determining, with the rising price determining who gets the NFT. But then when you go to an open edition, this is where supply is the variable that's fluctuating instead of price. So the, uh, so Nifty, for example, would say that a certain drop will be sold for $1,000. And then whoever wants to, for some amount of time, can buy an NFT. So there is not a limit on supply. And so in this case, you also reach an equilibrium because um, the supply will increase to the point where everyone, uh, where it's demand is satisfied at that given price. So you also, you're also getting equilibrium with these open editions. But where it kind of gets interesting from an economic standpoint is when you get to draws. So draws are basically where the NFT is raffled off. So there will be some limited amount of NFTs um, put up for the, for the raffle. And generally the demand is gonna far exceed the supply for these. Normally on NFT Gateway it'll be like 10 or, or like a hundred times um, as many people entering as there are actually NFTs to give out. And there is a, and the price is held fixed. So price is not a variable that can be used to um, allocate. And so what you get here is you have a shortage and there is a consumer surplus created 
because people are able to get these NFTs for below their willingness to pay or below other people's willingness to pay. So as soon as somebody wins one of these draws, they have the ability to immediately resell for potentially a significantly higher amount uh, because of that difference between um, what the real market rate would have been if price were allowed to fluctuate. Um, so that, that can make draws really attractive for people looking for like a short-term flip. Um, and you might not win, but you don't have to put money up in case you don't. And the opportunity, opportunity cost is pretty low uh, in terms of time to enter. Oh, that is so interesting. So the first method is where you have, the first two methods, you get equilibrium, the, both on the supply side and one, the other one on the demand side where you get equilibrium. And the third method is where you, are, you basically limit your supply to allow future demand to, continue, to continuously exist independent of the, the first release that, or the first scheduled release that's available. That's interesting. So can you talk a little bit more about the economics of reselling? When does it become profitable? Yeah, so when you're when you're looking to resell, it's good to have a plan going into it in terms of if you're looking at short term uh, resell or if you have more of a long term time horizon. So if you're going for a short term, like going back to the last thing I said, it's really good if you are able to get in on a draw, something where you have uh, where you immediately have buyers that are willing to pay more. But obviously, you're not always going to be able to get in on those. You want to find some other things that you can do. Um, so sometimes you might go to an open edition that you think a lot of people are really going to want. Like if you have a super high tier artist, you think maybe some people want maybe even more than one of these um, or something where there is a lot of hype around the project. So you think that demand is going to increase rapidly in a really short period of time which can happen a lot. We're talking about the crypto space where you can have huge, <laughs> huge price fluctuations in the blink of an eye. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity there for uh, short-term price movements. But there is also a lot that can be done around sort of long-term investment theses. Um, so here you wanna look at kind of those factors I was talking about before when you're looking for a good investment. You're looking at are you gonna get growth in community? Are you gonna get increases in utility? So looking at if it's around a game item, like how um, are, the, are the developers looking like they're on a good track to get out a game that will be engaging and fun for the community? Um, so yeah, just wanna look at the long-term growth prospects of whatever you're looking at. And if you think those are, have a really strong growth possibilities, then that can make for a good long-term investment. So looking at the first three models, the, initially you talked about how, how NFTs are released. So you have the allow bidding to happen. You have the open, like fixed amount of fixed amount and then people can just buy unlimited supply. And then you have limited supply and the kind of draw method. And in this case of reselling, would it only make sense if you're going to do the third method, which is the, the draws method? That, it, it could depend a little bit on how much demand there are for these draws. Um, and I guess how much patience you have for entering them. Because sometimes I, I think currently it can be between like a half a percent to five to ten percent chance of hitting any a draw on any particular day. Um, I got lucky today actually and landed one of and landed one on a art drop. So it does happen, but if you're looking to like really dive in and be investing all over the place, you probably can't rely just on uh, draws as a way to invest in NFTs. Mm. You mentioned, you mentioned um, inflation just now. And can you share a little bit more about inflation in the NFT aspect? Yeah, so a lot of people, when they're thinking about the supply side of NFTs, they we'll look at the number of editions of something. Like say you have an NFT, it says it's got 10 editions. And then people are like, all right, I've only got nine other sellers I have to worry about in terms of the valuation for my NFT. And for them, it, it normally ends right there. 
but it's really important to look at the rate at which new NFTs are being introduced because a project can create a new NFT that prospective buyers could see as a substitute. Um, they might not think that it's worth the exact same, might not be worth the exact same, uh, might not be valued at the exact same price, but a potential buyer could look at your NFT and the new F NFT and think, eh, I, might, I might spend my money on the other one. And so the existing pool of buyer funds is now getting split over a greater number of NFTs. So even though the number of additions of your NFT is staying the exact same, you're, the market is still being diluted. So watching the rate of inflation is really important in picking out a project for investability. Um, like I think a good comparison here is if you look at CryptoPunks and CryptoKitties, because both of them have claimed to be kind of like the original NFTs. They're both super early on CryptoPunks kind of technically the first, but CryptoKitties was like the first really one that like really got people's attention. But a key distinction between the two projects is that CryptoPunks has a hard cap at 10,000 punks. But then with CryptoKitties, uh, a big part of the whole experience was just breeding more and more kitties, increasing the supply. And then even though like each kitty is unique, there you're, as the supply is increasing, there are now more and more NFTs for potential buyers to look through. And overall, that's making any specific NFT investment less and less attractive over time. And that's why I, I think that's a primary reason why CryptoPunks has really come out as the winner between those two as the really like classic uh, original NFT um, it, for a long term investment thesis. So it's almost like a crowding out effect of your substitute of your asset compared to all the other similar assets out in the entire space. So all the other NFTs available, not just how limited edition your NFT is. Yes, exactly. And when it comes to limited edition, it just feels like every single NFT is limited edition. So the whole point of value from limited edition just gets diluted because of the inflation effect that everyone is limited edition. Yeah, you. Yeah, it's really important to kind of find out like, how limited is limited? Like what is the future expectations for other other limits? Because yeah, like, as you said, like the more limited you have, the kind of <laughs> less limited the entire collection becomes. And you talk a little bit about utility just now, which is something that's very, it's not really explored yet in the NFT space. And I guess the, the closest that we can look at in utility for NFTs would be art and, and music and digital art that you can enjoy that has this intangible value of utility. What are the other kind of utilities that could be embedded in NFTs? I, I think gaming is probably the biggest one that comes to mind. So um, I, I, I came into NFTs actually from like the gaming perspective. I traded game items before I ever got into crypto. Um, and so you have kind of this, um, you have a consumption aspect of people who want to use it uh, just because they're playing a game. Um, and yeah, you're just really looking at what kind of markets can be created to where people want to use it, regardless of any spec, regardless of any speculative aspects. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head of any other like specific aspects there, but I think that's going to be a huge area of growth coming up within like even the next couple of months here, I, I'm hearing a lot of people just starting to think about how utility can be uh, brought into the NFT space. Um, and uh, I guess actually uh, ticketing was one that I've kind of heard uh, bounce around a lot. So like concert and event tickets, um, as historically people have had a lot of problems um, in terms of getting them to the real fans and not just giving them out to scalpers and making sure that tickets are the real ones and not just some some fakes. And so I can see NFTs as being uh, useful there from a utility standpoint. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense for, for ticketing. Hmm. Interesting, because I've been talking about like a little sidetrack. I've been looking at develop, 
just creating a little webinar, but playing around with NFTs. So ticketing via ticketing of the webinar via NFTs. But I thought it was just a fun idea. Now that you mentioned it, might be something to to just experiment with to see if there is real value in that, because that would be quite fun. Yeah, that'd be that'd be a good test case for it. Okay, so um, going back to flipping NFT, how can anyone get started on flipping NFTs? Well, um, not to plug my own content too hard, but I have a website, nftflipping.com. Uh, got lots of guides out there for uh, getting someone who's new to the space um, in, even if you haven't dealt with cryptocurrency before. Um, and then even if you have some experience, got some good strategies to up your game a bit. But even if you don't want to read that, my recommendation is just get involved in different NFT communities. Really go down the rabbit hole, talk to people, and learn about the space um, by interacting in a bunch of these different areas. How, how comfortable does one have to be with crypto to get involved in, with NFTs? It's getting easier and easier. Um, you don't you don't actually have to have like a MetaMask wallet anymore for a lot of these applications. Um, on the art side, um, like if you look at Nifty Gateway, you can buy in with a credit card. Um, on the gaming side, NBA Top Shot has done a really good job of onboarding kind of the mainstream users with, again, just a credit card, username, password, onboarding. Um, and so it's, it's really getting more and more approachable. And that's kind of a trend we're going to get on over time, maybe sacrificing a little bit of decentralization um, just to get those people on board who otherwise would not be willing to put in the effort to get involved in the space. And yeah, it's good to know that things are getting a little bit more mainstream. The barriers of entry is just a bit lower so that anyone can just participate. Because going back to the non-NFTs, those kind of other DeFi tokens, it can be a little bit complicated for someone to even get started. So I, I think that's one of the reasons why there's huge demands with NFT because people are interested in crypto anyway, but the traditional crypto or the top 10 by market cap or even DeFi is just quite hard to get in. Whereas NFT is easy to understand. It's, it's similar to trading baseball cards when you were young and the gateway or the entry barrier to enter and hold one of these NFTs is a lot, is a lot easier. So it's just the selling part or the supply side that is limited, but the demand side is kind of infinite for, for the current the current time span. Yeah, but it's, it's definitely improving. And um, we're getting more and more coverage of it every day. I'm starting to see NFTs coming up in like my mainstream news sources, especially after the Beeple auction selling mm -hmm. for $69 million today. Um, so it, we're seeing really good signs of growth and kind of now pushing uh, NFTs more into the mainstream consciousness. I think the, the other part of the economics of these NFTs flipping is the gas cost. Because a lot of these NFTs are built on layer one, which is extremely expensive because you're fighting for transactions with all the other DeFi things that's going on. And these people are actually trading, especially if like high frequency trader, for instance and they're just paying so much in gas fees. So to even get an NFT, the amount of gas cost is just increase, crazy high. And how, do you, how can that, that justify the returns of flipping NFTs? Well, it, it depends on the platform you're using, but I, I agree, if you're doing any on-chain transactions on Ethereum, you're gonna run into really high gas costs. And this has kind of pushed up the this push up the barrier to entry for sure. You need a fairly large bankroll um, and a lot of artists are listing for pretty high amounts because they need to justify their gas costs in order to mint the NFT um, and might be creating a little bit of a speculative bubble, just kind of the um, that, be, that being the catalyst for it a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but then also you do have the ability to reduce some of that on by trading on more centralized platforms, uh, like on Nifty Gateway for uh, trades, you don't actually have to pay a gas fee um, for trades because those are just allocated between accounts on their centralized platform. And then if you withdraw to a wallet, then that's an on-chain transaction that would incur a gas fee. Because I would imagine that because of the gas fees, 
and as a supply or minter token minter, then you have to pay quite a bit of amount and hence the high prices of NFTs today. Because it's part yeah, of the cost structure. Exactly, yeah. Okay. So before we end, can you have if you have one recommendation that you could give to like NFT designers or this economists developing the economics of NFTs, what would that recommendation be? Don't forget about scarcity when you're missing your NFTs. Um, space out your releases, take a breath, um, keep edition numbers low, because I, I know it's really tempting to, when there's all this money on the table, to just put keep pushing out NFT after NFT after NFT. But if you put out too much, um, then you hit that substitutive inflation uh, effects that we were talked about before. And it ends up just hurting your early supporters. Um, and you really want to care about the people who are investing in you. Um, so just keep that in mind. And because we want to help make this a more sustainable space for the long run. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Do I pronounce Kiefer? Kiefer. Kiefer. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for having me. This is fun. Awesome. Speak to you soon. All right. Bye-bye.